Hello everyone and welcome to Guild Wars 2 Daily. Today we're going to be talking about lore and the footage in the background comes in from Guild Wars Insider who have been uploading to B-roll footage lately of somebody playing through the human starting stuff. So that's what will be in the background, many thanks to them and you can find a link in the description down below. So yeah, we're going to be talking about lore. I'm, I'm really glad you guys like that Massar episode. I might do more specials. I kind of have a bit of an aversion of doing highlights on specific races, particularly the playable races. I feel like there's already a lot of channels out there that have done that kind of stuff. But maybe some of the more peculiar lore I could start doing some specials on. Let me know what you think about that. But anyway, yeah, so the first question was asked by Slow Sloth, who said, I've got a question, but it's more tied to Guild Wars 1 than 2, so I may need help to rephrase it. At the start of Eye of the North, when you reach the structure that gives the expansion its name, your character Ogden and Vex say that it isn't human, dwarven, or a Surin built. So who built the Eye of the North? I may have rushed the content, but I also don't remember seeing a scrying pool before, and your characters seem to know how scrying pools work. Well, I, I do think this is kind of relevant to Guild Wars 2 because although it looks like we're not going to be able to go to this structure because you can't, can't really go that far north anymore in Guild Wars 2, it certainly does seem like eventually we'll be able to go back there. But this was a mystery that they set up. We, we were up in the Shiver Peaks and we'd heard about the Norn and it hadn't been entirely established how big Norn liked to build their structures at this point, but it was established that we, when we found this giant tower, this thing that the people of Tyria called the Eye of the North, when we found it, this massive thing, nobody really knew who had built it. When we reached it, we found that the even vanguard, some of the soldiers of Ascalon, still in their war against the Char, had pushed north and begun to use this existing massive structure as a base of operations when they started to attack the Char from within their own lines. And that's kind of the situation that we walked into, but nobody knew where it had originally come from. Even the Norn couldn't tell us where it had come from. So what was this big building? It was made out of this really weird material that we weren't quite sure about, he seemed to have this weird magical air about it and of course in this building in one of the back rooms of the building was a very magical device this pool of water called the scrying pool that we later learned to manipulate and it told us about the destroyers it told us about the great destroyer one of the elder dragon champions and we used this knowledge to eventually be able to defeat it and it was all very magical and interesting and you mentioned in the question here that our characters seemed to know how the scrying pool worked. Well, that's not necessarily true. They don't really set it up that humanity seemed to have experience on in general with scrying pools. And this is something that we're familiar with. In fact, when we go there, Gwen and the other people at the Eye of the North, it's implied, have never been able to get it to work. You know, there have been a lot of humans existing there and none of them have ever managed to do anything with it. So Gwen asks you to take a look at it, this great hero that's, you know, defeated a god previously and done all these amazing things. And you kind of lean over it and it's a bit of a cop out and it, you just make out that you've concentrated and it start, begins to show you the hero these visions. So there is some kind of magic there but I wouldn't argue that it responds to humans or that we as humans really knew how to access it, not the player character anyway. I think it was just that the pool chose to show us something because it deemed us a great hero. I suppose that's what they're going with there. But the question of who built it remained a mystery for a long time and we came up with lots of theories and lots of people were saying oh did the Massart build it did the you know we're all the typical ancient races that we don't know much about everybody at some point has speculated that could have built this thing but more recently there's been some more lore come out of one of the lesser races that was introduced in Eye of the North that's really expanded on our perception of them and I am pretty confident we can say who's built it now so Eye of the North introduced to us a half giant race of people these were the Norn they're giants to us as humans but really when we're talking about other giants that exist within the Guild Wars universe, they're still quite small. And some of these other giants in the universe were introduced with Eye of the North. They were the Jotun. You could find them in caves and they kind of have a bit of a history of the Norn fighting with the Norn. And they called the Far Shiver Peaks their home. In fact, we later found out that they just called the mountains, the, the Shiver Peaks in general, their home. These guys were a very tribal, mindless group of barbarians that really had no semblance of culture or way of life. They were just hunters gatherers and they couldn't really be communicated with and they only had a very small degree of intelligence and a very small ability to communicate with one another and that's kind of how they were set up much like many other races that are in the Guild Wars universe like the Grawl and like the Yetis or any other of those kinds of lesser races. 
But there was law written, I believe this was in the Eye of the North manuscripts that they said this, the hinted that the Jotun were a fallen race from Great Heights, that a long time ago they were a lot more than what you see them as now. And we didn't get much past that, but recently ArenaNet started releasing blog posts on, on different parts of the world, different races, different things like this. And one of their most recent ones was a look at the Jotun, and it taught us a hell of a lot more about what the Jotun used to be. Turns out, a long time ago, the Jotun were this all-conquering, intelligent, very powerful race with a serious grasp on magic and the way it works and an ability to weld magic that no other race really knew and any land they trod on was a land that they would conquer and they were just destroying and defeating every threat that ever rose up against them. They were very much like the Char, that you can see the Char now. However, the Jotun got to a point where they were such a high and mighty race and they'd reached the pinnacle of their success. They had nothing else to fight against, nothing, they were at the very top. And because they were at the top and nothing rose against them, they fell into infighting. And they fell into more infighting and more infighting until eventually they destroyed themselves. The Jotun were hungry for conquest and in the end the only things to conquer were other Jotun. And they essentially brought about their own destruction. Now you can draw some very cool parallels between the Jotun and the Char because you can say, well, the Char are very similar. Why didn't that happen to them? And the truth is, it could have happened to the Char. The same thing could have happened to them. But the humans came, and the humans served as this threat to this Char. This one goal for hundreds of years, this thing that they couldn't beat, that they could put all of their energy and their focus into, to destroying. And that kept the Char in some ways, although it split them in others when the humans assassinated the Can Ur, it kept them in many ways still as a united whole. And they didn't destroy themselves as a race. And now there is a treaty with the humans, but the Elder Dragons are there too. So the Char didn't suffer the same fate. The Jotun were never defeated by anyone, and they brought brought about their own destruction. So you hear about this race that was very old, very wise, as well as very powerful and something to be feared, and you hear that they built big structures, massive structures, magic, magical buildings in the Shiver Peaks that to this day, despite the fact that the race itself may no longer remember these things, they are still there, and I think, it's pretty clear, I think, that the Eye of the North is one of these structures. It was built by the Jotun, a race of giants that at one point were wise beyond we can possibly imagine at the moment, and that's how they came about building this scrying pool that would serve as such an essential tool in saving Tyria from the minions of Primordus all those years ago. So it's a really cool story. There is more to the Jotun about their kings and so forth, but uh, I mean, I could talk about the Jotun in a different time, but yeah, that's kind of my theory on the Eye of the North. I saw a lot of people were asking that question, so it's about time I uh, I finally got around to it. It's, it's really cool lore, actually. It really is. It's one of those mysteries we've had, and now we seem to have had a more tangible answer. Although, to be fair, it's not been specifically 100% stated that this is the case, so don't take my word as fact. Just take it as very close to it. The next question is a quick question which came from TDT Trailer who said, I may have missed something, but Guild Wars Wiki says that they were going to link the Hall of Monuments to your Guild Wars 2 character by declaring your ancestor, like my Silvari Necromancer is the great 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 grandchild of my human ranger. Tell me, is there some sort of law that allows interspecies relationships? Two things here, right? I'm going to keep this a quick question, but two things. One, a lot of people get confused by this, and the truth is, it's not like an ancestor in blood. You can be a Silvari, you'll just inherit whatever that human has left behind for for you so you'll inherit it while you won't necessarily have some kind of blood relation if you're playing as a human and you want to believe that you're the great 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 grandchild then that's fine but the game's not going to force that idea on you uh, and the other thing interspecies relationships they don't exist in Guild Wars lore. There's actually a quest in Guild Wars 1 where a non woman or a non man depending on what sex you're playing as your player character, um, will decide that they want to marry you and they want to start a family with you and you're, you're going to experience this non lifestyle and a non wedding and it's, it's a hilarious quest. It's really, really good. It's really well done. And this is the only time we've ever really heard of any examples of different species forming relationships with one another in that way. But it has been confirmed that these guys don't really ever mate at all. I don't think they 100% stated that it would be impossible for a Norn and a human to procreate. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of people like to theorize about how the Norn came into being and are they some kind of offshoot of humans or, or are humans an offshoot of the Norn? I guess that wouldn't work so well since we know that the humans are aliens to Tyria. But still, people have speculated about this kind of thing. I don't think 
think they've said 100% is impossible for every single situation, but you can pretty much say, no, it will never happen that Silvari has sex with a child. It's just not going to happen. And in fact, a lot of people will refute what I'm saying now and point to that quest I just mentioned, say, ah, but in Guild Wars 1, look at this. Uh, there was actually an interesting interview with Jeff Grubb recently where somebody asked him, hey, what do you, if you regret one thing, really, with Guild Wars 1, what is it? And one of the things he said he regretted was writing that quest into the game. He said that it just doesn't fit with what they were trying to do and he does regret having set up that this kind of thing would be possible because it just isn't something they really want to think about as being a part of the universe right now and he kind of wishes that it just hadn't been put there. So it is there and we can't deny that. So you can say, look, there is the possibility for attraction between these two races but I'm pretty sure they're avoiding the idea of having some kind of half Silvari, half Asuran character. But uh, there could be some interesting dynamic events or dialogue between characters of different races that have inexplicably fallen in love and the struggles they have with that, but I wouldn't hold your breath. The last question was asked by Runeclaw69, who said, For how long have the six gods that the human worship been silent? Did something special happen, other than the rise of a few grumpy lizards that made them stop aiding the humans? Or did they say something to explain their action? This is a brilliant topic, and you can talk about this for a very long time. There are a lot of things to talk about here. Uh, first, they've been silent for pretty much 250 years. Their silence essentially began with the defeat of Abaddon. So there's a cutscene in Guild Wars 1 towards the end of Nightfall. It's my favourite cutscene in the game. I love it. It's, it's amazing. Where you, the mortals, have gone into the, the realm of this fallen god into all, and you're like in the heart of it and just pitch black and everything's corrupt and you're basically going to die. You feel like you're all going to die and you've lost all hope. And you're there at the gates of Abaddon ready to fight this fallen god. But you're mortals and you don't know how to do it. And you're losing hope. And you desperately want the human gods to say something to you. They've been completely silent. They don't seem to have helped you at all in this fight. And you're losing hope. They haven't. You haven't heard anything from them. But eventually you manage to commune with these gods in a sunken temple of the Six. It was one of the original temples raised by humans to the gods. And it included a shrine to Abaddon himself before he became a fallen god. And there in the middle of nothingness, finally, the gods come and they approach you. They give you their blessings, essentially, but nothing tangible. And they tell you that it's your world now, that you as mortals have the power to do what they do not have the power to do, which would later be revealed that we have the power to absorb Abaddon's power, as Cormir then does, and then she rises to become a god herself. So that's all the gods tell you. And they, and then in that cutscene, the avatar of Lyssa, she just tells you, it's your world now, uh, we, we have to leave. It's your world to do with what you will. And then they're off. And that kind of marks the start of the silence of the six gods. They're not completely silent after that. I've talked before about this temple being built at Lion's Arch, so they are still kind of hanging about. And the idea is, I guess, that they've still got an eye on Tyria, but they're stepping back. They don't have so much influence on the world as they did during Guild Wars 1's time, where you could easily summon these avatars anywhere you wanted and get powers from them. So there is a difference there. That's kind of when they start their silence. So you ask, why are they being silent? And there are numerous theories you can go about here. One of my favourite ones, though, is the last time really these gods approach you, the humans, when you're desperate like this in this last place, is they tell you basically that you do have the power to defeat Abaddon and that they're leaving. And is it a coincidence that they tell you they're leaving at that moment? Well, you can say no. You can say that really the only reason the gods stuck around for as long as they did was because they knew that somewhere on Tyria there was a portal to a hellish place, the realm of torment, where one of their fallen gods lay trapped and the gods didn't feel safe leaving Tyria or leaving the races of Tyria on that planet because they knew this fallen god would eventually worm his way back out and try to destroy the world. So they watched over the humans until this time, until they knew that Abaddon was fully gone and that his influence would be removed from Tyria and then they deemed that it was safe for them to go. You can go far deeper than that and you can look at how how Abaddon gave the humans magic in the first place and that because Abaddon had still kind of got a part of this magic, for example he was still the god of secrets, that somehow the gods were bound to the place it gets very complicated and deep, I'll try not to get into it too much because we're already 16 minutes in but this is a really cool theory and this is my favourite one, that they only could leave when they knew that Abaddon had been defeated and the reason why they helped the humans so much up to that point is because they wanted the humans they wanted Cormir to be in a position where they could defeat Abaddon and 
refill that empty sixth position of their pantheon. Maybe they couldn't leave without that sixth being with them. And then they decided to go. Other theories include the fact that the gods knew the Elder Dragons were on the rise and that they feared the Elder Dragons, which is an interesting one. And then there are theories that the gods left for other reasons and it was because now the gods were gone that now the Elder Dragons decided to rise up because even though the Elder Dragons as individuals might fear the gods, that perhaps the gods were what sent them to sleep the last time. Maybe the gods didn't find Tyria already a barren wasteland with the Elder Dragons asleep. Maybe they defeated the Elder Dragons somehow. Although, again, it has been said that the Elder Dragons are more powerful than gods in some way. So, it, there's just a lot of theories about it. There is no tangible answer to it, though. There's a lot of really, really good ones. And maybe I'll come back to that in a few episodes because uh, it's, it's a really cool topic. I mean, why are the gods gone? And maybe more importantly, when will they be back? But there you go, guys. That was lore for today. Thank you very much for watching. I'm going to try and re-download The Witcher 2. Steam's not letting me buy it. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. The footage in the background was from Guild Wars Insider. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section down below. And I will see you tomorrow.